Thank you very much indeed, President Grimson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what a privilege it is to join you again at the Arctic Circle Assembly for the second time. Uh, as I said last year and want to reiterate today, Scotland is extremely keen to play a bigger role in the work that you do. Uh, we uh, have, as I said uh, last year, uh, the situation where the northernmost part of Scotland is geographically closer to the Arctic than it is to London. Uh, so both our geographical position and the commonality of interest that all of us are working to advance uh, lead me to believe that we have a great deal to learn from all of you here. But also perhaps we have the ability to share some of our experience and expertise with you. So it is wonderful to be here uh, with you again today, taking part in these deliberations. Uh, as well as my presence here today, Scotland is playing a bigger role in this assembly. Our chief planner will lead a session later this afternoon about planning for a low carbon future. And Nordic Horizons, which is an independent think tank in Scotland, is also leading a session on sustainable development in communities. Uh, and as uh, President Grimson has just indicated, next month Scotland will have the privilege of hosting our first ever Arctic Circle Forum, Scotland and the New North. Uh, that will be a, a two-day event in our capital city, Edinburgh, focusing in particular on innovation, science and sustainable development. Uh, I'm hosting a reception this evening to promote that event on the third level of this uh, fantastic centre and you would all be very welcome to attend. Uh, Scotland's involvement in the Arctic Circle is just one strand of our efforts to build closer alliances with our northern neighbours. Uh, we recently also published a revised policy statement to guide our engagement with Baltic and Nordic nations. And that illustrates how we are working with and learning from those countries across a range of different policy areas. So the key central message of my remarks today is that we want to co uh, deepen the cooperation uh, that we have and strengthen it further in the years to come. Now, it won't surprise you to know that my brief opening remarks this morning uh, will focus on climate change, the issue that we've just been hearing about, uh, our collective moral obligation to safeguard the planet for this and for future generations, and an area where uh, I'm proud to say that in many respects Scotland is leading the way. Uh, on Wednesday next week, together with representatives of Statoil, Norway's state energy company, the Norwegian government and Abu Dhabi's Master Institute, who are co-investors in the project, I will have the privilege of opening uh, the High Wind Scotland offshore wind farm, which is 25 kilometres off the coast of Peterhead, which is in the northeast of Scotland. Now, that's important because High Wind Scotland is the largest floating wind farm anywhere in the world. It will generate electricity to power thousands of homes, but perhaps more importantly, it's a sign for the future as we develop offshore wind in deep waters. Its establishment will further enhance Scotland's reputation as a home for new energy technology. Uh, we're already home to the world's largest tidal power array. The European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney is the foremost wave and tidal power testing site anywhere in the world. Uh, and we have impressive capabilities in other areas, smart grids and batter battery storage, for example. Uh, when Ban Ki-moon addressed this conference last year, he described the Arctic as the ground zero of climate change and highlighted that a temperature increase of 2% uh, worldwide might well mean an increase of four or five degrees uh, within the Arctic Circle. And we've just heard from Patricia Espinosa uh, about the need, how crucial it is that the world meets the Paris Agreement, that we ensure that global climate change is limited to well below two degrees Celsius. So my message today is Scotland wants to not just play our part, but lead the way as we have been doing in recent years. Our renewable electricity output in Scotland has almost trebled in the last decade. It's now equivalent to more than half of all of the electricity we consume. Uh, indeed, we are responsible for around a quarter of renewable electricity generation across the whole of the United Kingdom, uh, despite having less than 10% of the United Kingdom's uh, population. 
Uh, we're also on course to meet our 2020 climate change target, which when it was set was the most ambitious anywhere in the world. Uh, but as we heard from Madam Espinosa earlier, we know we need to go further. All countries now require to raise our level of ambition. Uh, so we will shortly legislate for tougher and more ambitious climate change targets. Uh, we're also setting other very ambitious long-term goals. Uh, we've announced that by 2032, our intention as a country is to phase out the need for new petrol and diesel vehicles so that we make that transition to electric and ultra low emission vehicles as quickly as we possibly can. Now, obviously, as I've said already and has been said by others this morning, tackling climate change is a moral obligation. But as the previous speaker said, and I wholeheartedly agree with this, I think the responsibility for all of us is not just to see it as an obligation and a challenge, but also to see tackling climate change, moving to a low carbon economy as a massive opportunity as well. Uh, in my country, 60,000 people are already employed in low carbon industries and there is scope for us to go much further. Uh, and that therefore is the approach we're taking by setting ourselves as leaders in the deployment of new low carbon technology. We want to send a message that Scotland is the place to invent and develop and manufacture these technologies as well. Uh, Arctic nations and other countries represented here are obvious partners for us in doing that. I've already mentioned the uh, Norwegian uh, influence in high wind. Uh, we're also working and learning from Denmark's energy efficiency program. I, uh, earlier this year, signed a climate change agreement with uh, Governor uh, Jerry Brown of California. Uh, and of course, when I arrived here in Iceland yesterday, I had the opportunity to visit Carbon Recycling International. Uh, their process for producing methanol in a sustainable manner potentially has great application in Scotland and indeed in many other countries. So these are all uh, tangible examples of that collaboration and partnership working. Uh, my final point uh, before uh, answering uh, some questions uh, from you is just to, to stress that although climate change and uh, the move to low carbon economies is the, the challenge that occupies our minds rightly, I, I see the scope for collaboration between our different countries as going much further uh, than that and even much further than economic collaboration. Uh, in Scotland, we are very keen to learn from the social policy innovations of other countries as well. Indeed, one of the questions that the world over is grappling with now is how we ensure that a dynamic, open and innovative economy goes hand in hand with fair, inclusive and sustainable society. Uh, so we are learning from lots of the countries represented here earlier this year we introduced in Scotland uh, a wonderful Finnish innovation in the form of the, the baby box uh, going to, to new parents. Uh, we're also learning from Denmark's experience in delivering support to those with disabilities and indeed working with Iceland and learning from Iceland uh, on how we protect vulnerable children. So there are many opportunities to deepen the collaboration uh, between us. Uh, my very final point, of course, relates to something that it's not possible for a politician uh, from the UK uh, to speak without mentioning, and that is, of course, Brexit. Um, I, as you know, deeply regret the UK's decision to leave the European Union. Uh, but notwithstanding that, I want to see the UK and Scotland retain the closest possible working relationship with our friends and partners across the EU. Uh, we want to see the UK remain, if not within the EU, then within the single market and the customs union. So in that, as in so many other issues, my message today is that we have so much to gain from working together, from learning from each other and looking for opportunities to deepen that collaboration. So thank you uh, very much for giving me the opportunity to be with you today uh, and I look forward now to hearing uh, your views and uh, answering the questions that you have for me. Thank you very much indeed.